Hedge funds are record short the VIX right now. The VIX is at 12.73 before markets open for Monday, April 29th. There is a, uh, let me, t I have the VIX chart up. So the VIX on December 24th, 2018 got as high as 36.07. It had been trending higher though for months before that. And then since then it has totally crashed. If you look at a chart of the VIX over the last six to eight months, it had that, it was trending upwards, got to that one big spike and it's just got hammered right back down. But the reason I'm doing this live stream show today, and it's going to be a pretty short one, is because there is a Bloomberg article out on April 26th, a couple days ago, by Sarah Ponzek. Hedge funds are shorting the VIX at a rate never seen before. So before I read the article, my educated guess for why hedge funds are short the VIX is because a lot of these hedge fund managers, which have very, very short term oriented, they have to beat their index, they have to beat their fellow hedge fund managers, be, otherwise they start getting pressured to have funds pulled out, is that they're betting on Fed rate cuts. And we have a Fed meeting coming up this week, so they're betting on rate cuts. That's probably part of it. There is QE, QE4 in the near future. Don't know an exact timeline on that. And the Jerome Powell put is now installed basically in the stock market from what it seems for a bunch of different reasons, whether it's plunge, plunge protection team, tax revenues for the US government, you know, a bunch of those different reasons. Okay, so let me read this article now. As equity surge to all-time highs, volatility has all but vanished. Hedge funds are betting the calm will last, shorting the CBOE volatility index or VIX at rates not seen in at least 15 years. What could possibly go wrong with that? Large speculators, mostly hedge funds, were net short about 178,000 VIX futures contracts on April 23rd, the largest such position on record weekly CFTC data that dates back to 2004 shows. Commonly known as the stock market fear gauge, aggressive bets against the VIX are, depending on your worldview, evidence of either confidence or complacency. Strategists lately have been pushing back on the idea that a lot of useful information is visible in VIX positioning data. Data. CFTC data doesn't take into account positioning seen in exchange traded products, which is notably long volatility, or the type of traders who hold the mix of both long and shorts as a hedge or relative value strategy. The VIX rose this week, but still remains below 13, more than 30% below the gauge's average over the last 20 years. While the VIX inched higher, so too did stocks, the S&P 500 rising to a new record. Okay, so that's it for this short little article. I would advise you, and I've talked, this is not financial advice, excuse me, this is just my opinion, um, not advice, but I've said for many, many times the last year or two, do not, whenever I talk about the record leverage short volatility trade and central bank intervention and interventionist economics with Keynesian economics and central planning, economic central planning, you should not short the VIX. You should not be long the VIX. And yet we have a bunch of hedge fund managers that are very myopic, very short, short term oriented who are doing exactly that. And again, I will repeat myself, what could possibly go wrong? And according to Christopher Cole, who is a hedge fund manager specializing in volatility, he has a institutional level hedge fund. It's not for retail clients and he sets up very sophisticated trades. He does not do these leverage short VIX um, ETFs. Those things you should stay away from very, very badly. I've had many of my listeners tell me that they've heard people talk about the VIX and that they've tried to go long volatility and they've lost a lot of money in a very short amount of time. So those double or triple leveraged ETFs with futures contracts on the VIX, stay away from those. Unless you are a very sophisticated investor or trader and you're, you day trade and you follow things you know, to the minute, to the hour, every single a lot put a lot of time and effort and research into this every day, you should stay away from those things. There are other ways to, if you, this is not financial advice, but there are other ways to trade volatility in stocks. And I think the clue that we've been given is what I talked about on the last longer live stream show with the tweet 
from the hedge fund telemetry guy about the lack of breath in the in all the different stock indices. So while the manipulation and the intervention and the plunge protection teams and the HFT manipulation is focusing on general stock market indices to keep them high or knock them higher with inflation, flight capital, you know, QE programs from different central banks, what we are noticing with the lack of breath from the other general stock, uh, stock market indices is that most of the companies are not participating in this fake bull market, okay? Most of the companies, I will repeat this again, in the Dow, in the S&P 500, in the NASDAQ, in the Russell 2000, in the Russell 3000, all those stock market indices, most of the companies are not participating in the higher index. It is a small amount of companies dragging the index higher or manipulation. So all of these companies do not have improving fundamentals. They do not have increasing revenues. They do not have increasing earnings. They do not have high margins or increasing margins. They do not have increasing free cash flow. So if you are, and again, not financial advice because shorting is extremely dangerous. The most dangerous and difficult thing to do in, st in, in the stock market or in any market where you can go long or short something is shorting because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Either I'll give you some examples of things that can go wrong, and these are from successful short sellers. You can, you can. Uh, it costs too much money to to borrow the shares because everyone is already short the stock. Okay, you could be right on the fundamentals of the company, but the management team could be committing accounting fraud or lying to shareholders or seek or be able to raise capital that no one thought they could raise, and this could blow up or delay the short thesis, the fundamentals playing out the way that you think. So you could be right on the fundamentals of the company. Look at, talk to people like Mark B. Spiegel and others who were early on Tesla Motors. Mark B. Spiegel was, long, was shorting Tesla Motors like four or five years ago. He was shorting Tesla four or five years ago. So while he was right on the fundamentals and he admits this to his credit, he totally screwed up the timing. So he was right about the fraud. He was right about a lot of the things, but he totally botched the timing of this. And this is why shorting is so difficult. There's a bunch of other reasons why with shorting, but normally it's the management team is aware their stock is being shorted and the management team is capable now in this new normal. They can get away with playing games. If you want to hear crazy stories, listen to the stuff that happened with Mark Cajodes and my medics and all the crazy crap that the people running my medics tried. It's on the QTR podcast, Quote the Raven. There's lots of stories on there. And Marco Hodes did a long, in-depth interview on Real Vision Television. There's a couple of them about this. So the, the VIX is down, and it may stay down temporarily, but there we, we are over $1.5 trillion in size on this leverage short volatility trade. And there are... According to Grant Williams and Ro Powell, who had a discussion on this, this leverage short volatility trade, not only is it on the stock market on the VIX, it has gone into other asset classes as well with options and futures. People looking to pick up income very aggressively on a trade, very short term, short term oriented and taking on way too much risk. The risk trade for a leverage short volatility trade, whether it's on the VIX in stocks or it's in other asset classes like shorting gold or silver or shorting, there's a bunch of other leverage short volatility trades on currencies and other things, according to Raoul Powell and Grant Williams of Real Vision Television, that people are desperate. These money managers are desperate to to produce any types of returns. And in the long term, these trades could blow up, but in the short term, they're making money. So that's the risk they're taking. In my opinion, the risk is not worth the reward, but they are doing it anyway. So I am not an expert on the VIX. I am an expert at looking at fundamentals of companies and telling you, you know, if there's something wrong with the balance sheet, uh, looking through the annual report. That's how I found the stuff problems with Tilray. Remember, I did a live stream video in August of 2018, and this when this is when Tilray I think was 150 or 160 dollars a share. It had gotten as high as 210, 220, maybe even 230 dollars a month or so before. And everyone was long marijuana stocks. And I was telling people, well, you got to be careful about this. I'm still getting listener questions about should I be long all these marijuana companies? Well, a lot of them are not good companies. You got to be willing to do the fundamental research to check and see which ones are frauds. And in the Again, not financial advice. I'm just telling you how I did the research. And in the annual reports, in the quarterly reports, in the disclosures from the lawyers, in the paragraph, the stuff about credit risk, the lawyers make sure the management team has to, has to list 
accurate risks about the company. Most people, including a lot of financial professionals, do not go and read these things anymore. I've gotten in arguments with article writers on Seeking Alpha claiming that management team did disclose things and then I go and look through the annual reports and the investor presentations, the PowerPoint slide decks, I read the footnotes, I read the in indexes in the investors' presentations, and the stuff these art these genius article writers on Seeking Alpha claim is there is maybe listed on page six on in one sentence. Meanwhile, the stuff, other claims that are not true or used to um, confuse or blatantly lie or shift the narrative away from an ugly truth for investors is prominently displayed in a bunch of different times. This is a specific mining company. I won't name its name. But this mining company is out there telling people, this gold mining company, they used to mine silver, now they mine gold. And they're telling people that their cash, uh, that all their investor material that they release publicly, their investors' presentations, their annual reports, and all this stuff, it says their cash costs are like uh, record lows, you know, $700 an ounce cash costs. And if you match those up with their free cash flow numbers, it's nowhere near there. And hidden in a management and disclosure um, MDA, Management Disclosure and Analysis of the Quarter, hidden like on the sixth page of like a 30-page document that they put out, one sentence saying close to what their real costs are. This is the new normal that we're in. The average retail investor is not going to figure this stuff out, guys. In fact, a lot of financial professionals who have worked a long time, um, especially in the newsletter writer industry where it's uh, a lot of it's all marketing, a lot of it's all fluff. A lot of people actually don't can't pick winning stocks. If they make like 10 or 20% on a stock in a couple years, they consider that a big win, which is ridiculous. But a lot of people in the financial newsletter community can't get win, um, don't know that stuff either. This, this mining company, which I don't want to publicly call out, is, you know, they're seeing what their cash costs are on all this different material. And then hidden in like a 30 page document, then is one sentence about what they think their real costs are. Do you think that's fair? Do you think the average retail investor is gonna spend all that time going through the different investors' presentations, 40 different slides, reading the footnotes, reading the index parts, all those slides, and then go through the annual report and look for stuff, and then go through management discussion and analysis of the quarter, all that too? No. In fact, most professionals don't even do that. Most professionals now don't even read annual reports anymore. So if you, I, I would avoid the VIX, you can watch the VIX, but I would not trade the VIX. If you want to take advantage of future stock market volatility, you're going to have to learn to do the fundamental research, the bottom-up fundamental research, and go look for the sectors of the economy, the industries that are getting hurt the most by the global macro conditions and the companies then that have the worst balance sheets, that have too much debt on their balance sheet. Their margins are being eroded. They have, um, maybe they have their their product or services becoming obsolete. They have too much competition. Tesla Motors, cough, cough, right? Look at all the, um, I just saw really good commercials out by the Audi e-tron. That thing looks great. A lot of the problems with Tesla, Audi addressed in their new commercial and they're pre-selling this stuff. So Audi, because they're a successful proven car company, they understand what the consumer wants, probably better than Elon Musk and Tesla Motors do. So if you want to go more in depth on the VIX, I highly recommend, uh, this, is, uh, this is just research, that there are three interviews from Christopher Cole for free on the Macro Voices podcast. His first interview was January of 2018. It's Christopher Cole, Volatility and the Alchemy of Risk. He then did a follow-up interview a month later after the vol spiked the first time, the VIX, excuse me, the VIX spiked the first time. He did that after the main interview and the post-game wrap-up. On January 25th, the interview was done, but it was released on February 8th, 2018. And then he did a more recent interview for Macro Voices on January 10th, 2019. Christopher Cole, the big one, vault event hasn't happened yet. And if you sign up for free to the, if you're very sophisticated and you want to learn about Christopher Cole's insights, I think Christopher Cole's probably the top expert on volatility that there is here in the US. There's one or two other experts, and I think they were either on a panel on Real Vision Television or it was on Macro Voices. I forget which one. It was on one of the two. But if you sign up for the free email for Macro Voices, they, can, um, they have the slide decks from Christopher Cole that he did for his interviews there that are in depth, that are like 40 or 50 page slide decks that detail 
uh, the problems with the volatility, how big the leverage short volatility trade is in stocks and other asset classes. And I'm assuming now that we are larger than the $1.5 trillion in size the leverage short volatility trade is. It was like a couple years ago, it was $1.5 trillion. But with more hedge funds piling in, I'm assuming it's a lot larger than even that. So this is another, just another potential economic landmine. And these hedge funds, there's not a lot of transparency there, but there could be another long-term capital management at some point if these hedge funds get too stupid and too greedy. So I just wanted to highlight that for you guys in this. Let me check my notes, make sure I got everything I wanted to talk about. Yeah, so I, I would not, avoid again, not financial advice, just my opinion. I would stay away from any leverage short ETFs. I would stay away from being long the VIX. I would stay away from being short the VIX. And uh, if you are going to be short in this market, the Fed is not going to bail out every single company. Okay. The Fed seems to care. The plunge protection team seems to care about the general stock market indices and about manipulating the passive investing index investing bubble higher to maintain tax revenues. And there's flight capital coming into the U.S. Other countries are still doing QE. The Fed may restart QE, but not every company is going to do well. And I outlined the amount of those in the last long live stream show, not yesterday's show, because that was different. That was a short show. But the last long show where I read you how not even 10% of all the companies in every major stock market index are doing well, okay? Not even 10% of the companies are making new 52-week highs, despite the fact that we have the Dow at, let me just pull it up real quick. The Dow's almost... Um, Probably in a couple weeks, if this continues, if the Fed does do do the rate cuts, the Dow may be at 27,000, a record high. The S&P 500 is at a record high. The NASDAQ, I think, is at a record high. So just craziness. But my, the point I'm making is not every company is participating in this fake bull market. Okay? There will be... What's the animal planet analogy? So, you know, the predators, like the wolves or the lions or the hyenas, they don't attack the pack of animals, right? They attack the the weak, the old, the young, the, the sick of the pack of animals that are, that are uh, you know, on the outside of the pack or struggling behind. And in this situation, that's what, if I was doing research and I've done research for hedge funds, I've done a lot of fundamental research for hedge funds. Some of it's paid, some of it's free over the years. Unfortunately, a lot of hedge fund managers have taken advantage of me and like harassed me for a lot a bunch of free research but you have to do you have to look for again not financial advice just my opinion but if you're looking for a good short you have to look for the individual company you have to look for fundamentals that are getting worse balance sheets getting worse too much debt on the balance sheet maybe they're borrowing debt to cover losses to do stupid share buybacks when the underlying business is deteriorating and then you look for a bad chart so it has to be a combination of bad fundamentals fundamentals getting worse and a bad chart, bad stock chart. And if you could find those things and the options are not too expensive on those or or like a hedged vault, uh, hedged trade with options so you can play like volatility trades with a put and a call, it's called the long straddle, you can do hedged shorting trades. But you have to do more research and you have to be sophisticated to do this. Okay, I've known a lot of smart people that have lost a lot of money trying to do shorting because they didn't know what they were doing. They thought they did, but they didn't know what they were doing. And, you know, with Tilray, you could tell in the disclosures when I was reading them for you guys on the live stream in August 2018, that the disclosures were bad. So the stock was going up, management was going on TV, and Jim Cramer, who was pumping it, and you know, saying all these good things. Meanwhile, all the financial releases the company was releasing were just garbage. They were bad. And when the company would announce an increase in revenues, the costs were rising in some cases faster than the revenues. So the spin from the mainstream financial media would be, oh, Tilray had revenue growth. Well, they left out how Tilray's costs were rising faster than their revenue. And in the disclosures, Tilray said, we're never profitable, we've never been profitable, we may never be profitable. So normally, if you're investing in a company, you really don't want to hear those words. That's like that's like investing on hope and prayer. Okay, you don't want to invest on hope. STCE Golf, um, I know a lot of people that have lost a lot of money on the VIX trade. 
It's almost like the shorting Japanese government bonds. Because you've heard, even Kyle Bass has talked about shorting Japanese government bonds, and I think he's lost on that trade too. So you should monitor the VIX, but you should not short the VIX. You should stay away from those leveraged ETFs, those double and triple ones. They're just awful. They're meant for day traders, and the average person just isn't aware of this, doesn't read their prospectus. It's just a really sad situation. But it looks like in the short term, the VIX is either going to stay flat or go lower, but it's not sustainable. So we'll just have to see what the central bankers decide to do. But if, this, if, the, if the hedge funds keep getting greedy and keep piling in, you're going to have one of them blow up like long-term capital management because they put too much leverage on the leverage short volatility trade. And then when the trade, when the VIX went up to 36 in December of 2018, you know, right after that huge crash in the stocks on the uh, Christmas Eve, if we have a VIX spike like that again, and there's too many hedge funds that are short this thing, short the VIX with leverage, one of them will blow up. And if it's big enough, it could cause long-term capital management type damage because I told you how big the VIX trade is now. It is larger than $1.5 trillion just in stocks so that are short the VIX, leverage short volatility trade short the VIX. So there are other leverage short volatility trades in other asset markets with options and with leverage. This is a crazy new normal we're in where a bunch of supposedly smart professional money managers who went to the who worked at the best investment banks and went to the best business schools and had the best economics degrees possible think that they're smarter than us and think that they uh, like Hillary Clinton's husband or what's the other guy's name John Corzine think that they can use leverage to short government bonds or make a currency trade and get rich quick and make a lot of money and then because they're using leverage, it amplifies the losses. Okay, well, I'm going to take a look at listener questions and comments. I think I, sorry, I reached over for my notes here. I put them down. Let me make sure I covered everything. Options, options in the hand of uh, in the hands of someone who knows fundamentals, knows technicals, and knows to use options for leverage. If they know what they're doing they can be really good. If not, they're extremely dangerous. Most of the people I have spoken to who lose a lot of money on options, they don't know any fundamentals or technicals about stock market trading or other asset classes, and they think that they can get rich quick, and they stupidly put way too much money before they learn what they're doing into options trading. So in the hands, um, I would say options are basically like someone operating a power tool. So if you don't know how to use like a chainsaw or a power saw, and you haven't gotten any training, you shouldn't be using the most sophisticated power tool right away, should you? No. Okay, so if you don't know what you're doing, you should probably practice on something else first. It's like going to the shooting range, right? So you're not going to just pull out, you're not just going to pull out like an AK-47 at like a shooting range uh, in Texas or something like that, or an Uzi. I think Texas allows that stuff. You're not going to use one of those guns first. You're probably going to want to practice on something, maybe a 22 or 9 millimeter first. Especially like those videos where I see the parent lets the little kid use like a, a way too powerful gun. It's just really dumb. At a shooting range. And in other situations, there's been, you know, really bad accidents with that. That's just stupid parenting. Grow AUS says one day soon the VIX will spike again. Yes, I agree the VIX will spike again, but the hedge funds don't care about the long term. Okay, this is the point I'm making. The hedge funds have their investors are pressured. So a lot of these hedge fund guys are so greedy, so short term oriented, their egos are so big, so much hubris that and they have bad clients because a lot of the clients for hedge funds are bad too let's just be honest a lot of them are harassing and annoying that if they are not trying to figure out new ways to increase returns that people will call up and say i'm pulling my money out i'm moving my money over there over to this other guy that can give me a slightly higher return with more risk that guarantees a higher return a lot of hedge fund investors are just like they're they're short term oriented too and from what I hear, they're annoying. And that's why uh, a lot of hedge fund managers now are either quitting or being forced out. Especially the ones who had really good long-term track records in the past. I discussed some of this on the last long 
live stream show as well, that a lot of these hedge fund managers that made a lot of money in the past, they don't understand how the central banks, politicians, um, governments, uh, bureaucrats are all changing the rules so much. So the goalposts are being moved, the rules are being changed, and a lot of cases it's covert. So sometimes it's overt and they announce the rules changes to us or announce they're doing a QE program or announce that the mark to market for banks is being suspended or the banks are getting a bailout or something like that. But in other cases, you know, these bailouts and rules changes are occurring and the money manager just doesn't know. So that's why a lot of these guys that in the past under a different set of rules made a lot of money and now they're struggling to make any money at all. A lot of them are actually losing a lot of money. Uh, shorting, Vajra shorting is just is just making a bet that the price of like a commodity or a stock will fall. So normally, normally you have to borrow if you're gonna use shorting without options. You would have to call up your stockbroker, and norm it depends if you're gonna use all cash or use margin debt. But you'd have to call up your stockbroker, and the stockbroker would have to be able to borrow the shares from for you. So the stockbroker would have to go around and call up other stockbrokers if they don't have shares to borrow at that uh, brokerage and find out a interest rate that you would have to pay to borrow the shares to short. But if you're right, you can make a pretty good return, but it's riskier. The average retail investor should not be shorting. It requires a lot of fundamental knowledge, knowledge of charts, and then using the options for leverage normally. But regular shorting, you can theoretically lose unlimited. If you borrow the shares and you're wrong and the stock goes up a lot, you can lose unlimited. You can lose a lot more money than you risked with the bet you made. And that's why options for shorting tend to be, yes, options are dangerous. Yes, options are time oriented, but they tend to be safer because you can normally only lose the amount of money you risked and bet with the options contracts you bought. That's all you can lose. So you cannot lose more than you risked. Um, Samuel asked, can I talk about the Canadian housing market? So um, World Alternative Media, I think Josh Sigurdsson, he's from Canada and he interviews people from Canada. There are a lot of problems in the Canadian housing market. They've tried to do intervention with the empty house tax in Vancouver, but the other alarming problem is that a lot of Canadians have borrowed against their houses with either second mor mortgages or home equity lines of credit, massive ones. And then there's massive amounts of outstanding credit card debt for Canadians. So I don't know how much the exact amount of time, how much longer this goes on, but Australia and Canada are basically in the same boat with their housing bubbles. And honestly, man, I think a lot of the, the problems with the Canadian and, and uh, Australian housing bubbles, it has to do with Chinese money, okay? The majority of housing bubbles that have that have been re either reinflated or caused since 2008, the very a very large percentage of them are thanks to Chinese money. Okay, it's more than 75 percent. Okay, China has a lot of money leaving China thanks to their QE program or just people stealing money and laundering it out of the country uh, has caused a massive housing housing bubbles in many different areas. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of ways to get screwed over. Um, Tyler brings up a good point. You assume the clearing houses won't screw you. So I should bring up a story. I've talked with uh with Kevin Duffy of Bearing Asset Management. He used to be partners with Bill Lagner, and they had uh options. They were short credit default swaps, they were short the home building companies, they were short the banks prior to the 2008 financial crisis, and they did not they were only using puts. And they didn't get screwed over by their um, clearinghouse and their brokerage. However, um, during the 2008 financial crisis, hedge funds that say had Goldman Sachs as a clearinghouse or Morgan Stanley, if they had borrowed the shares, their shorts were often canceled out. So if you, are, if you have the trade set up, right, and you borrow the shares, the people in power, the stock brokerages, because remember, Goldman Sachs was deeply involved in the mortgage-backed security, selling that garbage, 
They were selling credit to false swaps. 2008 financial crisis. Their counterparty was AIG. There was a lot of problems with Goldman Sachs. And so they canceled out a lot of people who were their clients, including many hedge funds, who, who had borrowed the shares and were shorting banks, other bank stocks and home builders, and they canceled out their trades. But from what I've heard in 2008, the people who are using puts and not actually borrowing the shares, they didn't have their trades canceled out. So, but this is the thing. We don't know if what the people are going to do when the next crisis comes and how the rules are going to change. So just because Kevin Duffy and Bill Lagner made millions of dollars for themselves and for their, their um, investors back then because they were, they were right that puts were safer back then doesn't mean that puts will be safer in the next crisis. Doesn't mean that the rules will be changed for puts and not for borrowing shares. So you have to be cognizant of this that the people in power, the economic and political elites, whether it's the central banks or the or the stock brokerages, that they can and will change the rules. Okay, I've gotten two super chats today from Zend Memel. So thank you for the five dollars. Appreciate that you like the stream. And James Hernandez, thank you for the five dollars. Okay, well, we're at 30 minutes, and um, I'm going to attach links to the Christopher Cole interview and also the Bloomberg article if you want to read it more for yourself. But I just want you to, guys to, to watch the VIX because if the VIX starts going out of control, that will be a sign that things are bad. Because remember, when the VIX spiked to 36, we had the Steve Mnuchin announcement about you know, plunge protection team meetings about, you know, there is no bank liquidity problem. And one of the sources I pay attention to, this guy named Jared Dillon, who worked, he was a vice president at Lehman Brothers, and he's a very well, very well respected. He was a paid newsletter writer. I think he's now going to be a, a personal finance guru. And he said the reason that Mnuchin made that announcement with the plunge protection team and others was there actually was a liquidity crisis and no one's found out the real version of it, but they put that out there because the people who were being affected, they got like a heads up that they were going to be taken care of. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for now. Everyone have a great week and I will work on producing more great content for you guys. Okay, bye.